Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 215 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, on most weeks by the infamous, the elusive, Mr. Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how's it going? I'm very good, Joey. Yourself? Very good, my friend. Very good. Um, let's dive into the review part. No surprises there. The same place as always. We're going to start, though, in a place we don't always start in, at the Caesars Palace in Dubai. Um couple fights to mention over here. Firstly, friend of the show, Jack Catterall, picked up another win. Still waiting to be to be called, really, I suppose, as the mandatory for the WBO uh, Super Lightweight World title. Anyway, another win for him now, 25-0. and 0. Um, A shutout on one card, nine rounds to one on the other card, and I think eight rounds to two or something like that on the other card. So quite wide there against Timo Schwarzkopf, over ten rounds there unanimously. Uh, moving down at the bill, we had Thomas Patrick Ward. He picked up an eighth round unanimous decision. A complete shutout for him against his opponent, his opponent uh, Martin Casillas. Now 20 and 12 with one draw. Patrick Ward, or Thomas Patrick Ward, 29 and 0. I really, really want to see him stepped up, though. It's a bit of a waste of time at the minute, to be honest. He's, he's still young, though. Um,. Also on that bill, Vijenda Singh was able to beat Charles Adamu. Um, it was an eighth-round unanimous decision for Singh. So all the big-name fighters on this bill went the distance. They got the wins very wide. And I think um, Singh had Adamu down, I think it was about two or three times during the fight, something like that. So um, a good win there for Vijenda Singh. Want to see him a bit, a bit more active. He's now 12-0. and 0. Uh, Moving out now to the York Hall, Bethnal Green, London, United Kingdom. Over here, of course, the, um, the what's it called, that tournament again, the Golden Contract Tournament with MTK. Um, yeah, so let's start with Logan Yoon, a guy that decided to go on YouTube and get all of his footage taken down so no one could... Uh, you know, see how good he was. He was a southpaw. Um, O'Hara Davies didn't even know what stance he was on fight week. I think he uh, he found out last minute or whatever. I think someone actually gave him the lowdown. <laughs> he, he wasn't um, he wasn't bothered about naming them um, in the post fight interview. So he knew a little bit about him, but of course, you know, Logan Yoon really went 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 uh, quite far with deleting all the footage. No one knew anything about him. He was a sparring partner of Jorge Linares. He, he was a great amateur. I think 100 wins, 11 losses. You know, undefeated as a pro. I think he had 12 KOs, so a bit of a banger. And of course, um, notoriously, O'Hara Davies doesn't get on great with Southpaws. He lost, of course, to Southpaw Josh Taylor. And he lost to Southpaw Jack Catterall. Um, but Logan Yoon, in my opinion, was... Well, I mean, not a waste of time. I think he was talented, but yeah, he wasn't He wasn't really on the level of O'Hara Davies. I didn't feel like Yoon racked up loads of rounds. I felt like O'Hara Davies was pretty much in control. He looked the more comfortable in there. Um, obviously, he's got that power. He's got those freakishly long arms. And to be honest, at, at no point in the fight was I worried for O'Hara Davies. I felt like he was he was in, in command, really. So he won the fight in the end. Um, they pulled Logan Yoon out, really, at the first sign of danger. In the seventh round, I think he took a bit of punishment. And then he went back to his corner and they pulled him out on his stool. So very disappointing there. Logan Yoon, no point in deleting all his footage off YouTube. May as well just put it all back up now. I think he should put it all back up, actually, because if, if, if the only piece of footage on him is that fight there, then everyone's going to just, I don't know, not be interested. and They're going to think they're going to beat him easy because uh, that was that was quite a poor display from Logan Yoon. O'Hara Davies gets the win, 20-2 and two now. Logan Yoon served up his first loss. He loses his O, 16-1. Um, on the undercard... 
Mohamed Mamoun picked up a win. It was a TKO for him over five rounds against Darren Surtees, now 12-1. and one. Again, he loses his O. Obviously, Mohamed Mamoun, former European champion, a guy that was able to beat Sam Eginton, now 22-3. and three. I think he's probably the favourite of the tournament. I want to see him um, and O'Hara Davies. I think those two are probably the standouts, really, out of the tournament. Um, the tournament candidates, obviously, you know, O'Hara Davies kicked off with Darren Surtees. I wanted to see that fight. O'Hara Davies kicked off with um, with Tyrone McKenna. I wanted to see that fight. Now Surtees is out of the tournament. So the next round, hopefully, O'Hara gets either Tyrone McKenna or Mohamed Mamoun because those are the two the two fights I'd like to see for him. There, there, there can only, there's only three guys he can box in it because I think four people go through, don't they? So um, hopefully he gets one of those two. Hopefully we don't get stitched up again like we did in the first round where all the fights happened that no one really fancied. Um, it is just luck of the draw, though. Also, Kieran Geffen, um, he... He obviously went into the bout with a record of 9-2 and two with one draw. They pulled in Jeff Afori, who actually boxed, I think it was six or seven days prior to this one. And um, he, he got an upset win back then on that weekend. And he came over for this fight here with, I think it was two or three days notice. Turned up, obviously he was on weight because he boxed the, the week before. Uh, he, he jumped in last minute and he was able to... I'm not quite sure how it works because it, it's listed as a split draw over 10 rounds, which it was when, when you totaled up the three judges' scorecards. But they introduced the fourth judge and then Afori ended up getting the win. So he's pulled off two brilliant wins, two upset wins within seven days. And, um, you know, this one was a last-minute replacement job. So unbelievable stuff for Jeff Afori. Great for him. He's now 11-1, um, and one, I believe, because it's, it's strange. I'm looking on the internet. It's saying it's a draw, but they've brought in the fourth judge to make him go through. So he won the fight, but it's still listed as a draw. So I'm not quite sure how that works, really, there. Um, that's very strange. It's almost like the fourth judge was an unofficial judge. That's the only thing I can think of, but I don't think he was. So that's weird. I think it was the referee who had to give his scorecard in. Um, very strange. Very, very strange. But anyway, he proceeds to the next round. That's all that really matters there. Uh, also on that bill, Tyrone McKenna was able to beat Mikey Saki very wide, actually. Um, I was gutted for Mikey Saki. Obviously, our listeners, our long-term listeners will know I got a bit of a soft spot for Saki um, since his fight against C.R. Osgall. But yeah, he was able to get beaten very, very wide. Ten rounds to, to zero on two cards and nine to one on the other card. I felt it was a bit more competitive than the scorecard showed, but still the right man won, Tyrone McKenna. Now 20 and one with a draw. Mikey Saki, eight and three. Um, moving out now to the Echo Arena Liverpool. Um, I'm going to just start with a main event. Iaz, you can take over here. Callum Smith remains undefeated, 27 and 0 now. A defence, of course, of his WBA Super World Super Middleweight title, and um, also the WBC Diamond Belt. He's now the Ring Magazine champion as well. I think he may have already had that belt. John Ryder served up another harsh loss on the cards. Now 28 and 5. Both boxers cut on their right eye during the fight. Unbelievable fight, though. Talk to me. Yes, it was an unbelievable fight. John Ryder, obviously, he's one improve of that's um, improved. Since his Nick Blackwell defeat, right, he's improved and improved. He's went to Vegas in his fight before the Callum Smith guy and knocked, uh, knocked, knocked a fire right in the Golden Boy for, uh, on a Golden Boy card. But, oh, God. Before the start of this fight, um, uh, he, Callum Smith was a huge favourite and everyone wrote of John Ryder. Um, within the start of the first round, um, I was um, I was analysing this from the first to the 12th round. First round, um, it was a, a Callum Smith round. Second round, I gave it to John Ryder. Third round, I gave it to Callum Smith. Fourth round is when the heads are clashed, and that's when Callum Smith will cut eye. Um, obviously, in the fifth round, I gave it to Callum Smith. But from the sixth round, I, I personally had John Ryder winning the rounds. Sixth round, John, Ry John Ryder was pushing him, pushing him, pushing him right to the back of the edge. John Ryder had him on the ropes, um, hitting him, body shotting him. Seventh round, I had Callum Smith uh, on that round. Eight, I had John Ryder. Nine, I had John Ryder hitting him. Ten, I had John Ryder. John Ryder on 10th round, yeah, John Ryder was actually going for the, the 11th fight where I had John Ryder, obviously. Because I, the, when, I, when I saw the fight, John Ryder was actually going for it more than Callum Smith. Callum Smith did land some good punches, but it, he, didn't, it didn't land, he didn't do much on John Ryder. He didn't drop him at all. And on the 12th round was a very... Um, the, so the 11th round, once we go back to the 11th round, 
I mean, the eleventh round, John Ryder was actually pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing him and hitting him, hitting him, hitting him, and obviously it had a bit of effect. You can see that um, Callum Callum was bleeding more and more slowly. Obviously, John Ryder had a bit of blood coming from his nose, but on the twelfth round, I had John Ryder. Um, obviously, uh, um, John Ryder, John Ryder you, um, used his jab a lot, hit him with some good body shots, um, hit him. Um, obviously, had him on the ropes. But the one thing, once the fight, obviously, we saw that Callum Smith won the fight. One of the judges, Terry O'Connor, had it 117, 111. Now, what was that? I didn't have that. I had John Ryder winning the fight by a minimum three rounds. They, they're all saying Callum Smith, Canelo, Canelo, Callum Smith in a big, uh, big fight. Anfield, personally, I don't think he's ready for a big fight yet. He, could, he didn't do much on John Ryder. He, this was meant to be Callum Smith's knock a life. Um, he, this was a fight which was streamed on DAZN. And was, was was being shown in America. He should have made a huge statement, but he didn't. He didn't do nothing. John Ryder for me made that huge statement, and and he's they said that look, I have a fight of either Benavidez, Billy Joe, Chris Eubank Jr., Canelo, Golovkin. Personally, if I if I want to see Callum Smith fight in um, another big fight, I'd rather see him fight John Ryder again. So you've got your scorecard there, Ayaz. Um, before I break it down from my angle. Um, obviously, we know scoring is subjective. Let's just compare scorecards, though. Um, so, the first round you gave to... Who was it again? Callum Smith. You gave Callum the first round, yeah. I Yes. I gave I gave Smith the first round. The second round, I gave to Ryder. Um, I gave it to... I, I thought I had Callum Smith that second round. Okay, the third round, I gave it to... Uh, I gave it to I gave it to Smith in the first round as well. Same third round Smith. So you giving him the first three? Yeah, yes. Oh no, second round I gave it to John Ryder. Apologies. Yeah, that's what I thought, that's yeah, what John Ryder. So so yeah. So I yeah. so I gave it to Smith the first round and and Ryder the second round. So we we agree yeah. on that. Third round I gave it to Smith. Who did you give it to? Smith as well. Okay, so we we had it two one to Smith after three. Fourth round I gave it to Smith. Yes. Fifth round. And that's when, oh, it was, go on, sorry. That's when it was the head of class, wasn't it? The four, after the fourth round. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, 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 I think so. And then the fifth round, I gave it to Ryder. Uh, the sixth round, I gave to Smith. The seventh round, I gave to Smith. And then... From there, with John Ryder. Yeah, I mean, Ryder, I gave, I gave him the eighth, I gave him the ninth, I gave him the tenth, I gave him the eleventh... And I did him on twelfth as well. Yeah, the twelfth I felt was was quite a close round. But anyway, I I quickly run for it. Um, yeah, the first round. I mean, John had two spells in the round where he did well with a few combinations. But other than that, I felt like Smith probably dominated for most of the round. But neither man really, you know, laid down a marker as such. It was a nothing round really. But having to score it, I gave it to Smith. Um, I think Andy Lee gave it to Ryder. The second round for me was was a Ryder round. I mean, Smith was really showing Ryder that respect. I was happy to see that. Um, sometimes uh, it can be bad news for Callum Smith's opponents because when he goes into a fight underestimating his opponent, we don't usually see the best of him. And um, he looked focused in there, but like I say, he seemed to really respect John Ryder early on. Um, before before Ryder had really done anything at that stage. So I was starting to think, what kind of performance is this from Callum Smith? What are we going to see here? Is he not going to be on his A game? Is he going to be on his A game? And he, he ended up not being on his A game or, or not as good as what we thought he'd be. You know, most people thought he'd win. Talking of the predictions, yourself, I, as, and the listeners both went with a KO for Smith. I went with Smith on points. And obviously I gained the point there. But I said it on last week's show, I thought we'd be a close fight. I felt like Callum would win. But um, I thought it would be a close fight, you know. I thought it was going to go to the cards, and I thought every round would be a, would be you know a close round. I think I said exactly that on last week's show. Um, again, in that second round, Ryder was investing in the body early. Um, the third round, Smith was starting to find his range. He was letting his hands go. Not everything was landing, and I was very impressed actually with Ryder's elusiveness and his defense as a whole. Um, you know, Smith definitely put his foot on the gas in that round, and for me, he won it. So, like I say, two uh, one to Smith on my card. Uh, Andy Lee had it 2-1 Ryder. Again, the scoring was so subjective. Um, the fourth round, a close round where both men had moments. I felt like Smith just nicked it. 3-1 to Smith. Again, that one could have gone either way. The fifth round was a brilliant round. Um, it was the best round of the fight at that point. I think that was where the cut happened, actually. Could be wrong. I think it was a, I think it was the fifth round. Might have been the fourth. Um, for me, though, Ryder did enough, so it was 3-2 for Smith. Sixth round, I gave it to Smith, so I had that... Um, 
uh, 4-2 to Smith. Seventh round, going into the second half. Obviously, Smith, for me, won the round. Um, Paul Smith himself gave it to Ryder. I noticed that because he said after seven, he, he gave Ryder, I think it was two rounds. But I actually had only given him one. So uh, perhaps I was being a bit harsh. Um, you know, Ryder definitely had big moments in that seventh round. He was sinking the big hooks into the body of Smith, especially. Then in the eighth round, for me, it was a close round. It was a good start from Smith, but I felt like Ryder came, came on strong at the end. I felt like Ryder may have nicked it. So I had it 5-3 to Smith after eight. And, you know, in the second half, that is where, that is where, especially in the later rounds of the second half, that was where Ryder started taking over. The ninth round was a Ryder round for me. He was unloading when he got Callum Smith on the ropes. He was making him pay for it. And I was really impressed just by the, by the incredible performance from Ryder. He had pure hunger in his work. Uh, the tenth round for me was probably a Ryder round. So I had it 5-5 five, five with two to go. In the eleventh round, it was a massive round. It was incredible stuff from John Ryder. I expected Callum might might be the one to step it up a little bit in those championship rounds, but Ryder was the man who put his foot on the gas. And, you know, Smith was really struggling with the small size of Ryder. He didn't look like the best super middleweight in the world in there. So for me, I had it 6-5 Ryder going into the last round, and Smith even looked stunned in the dying seconds of the 11th. And the 12th round, an unbelievable round, but it was close. I felt like Smith started well, Ryder ended well. Many rounds were close throughout the fight, and many rounds were toss-up rounds. I disagreed with some Ryder rounds. That um, that Andy Lee awarded, and I I gave them to Smith, and then I gave Smith some. Uh, sorry, I gave Ryder some rounds when Andy Lee would give them to to Smith. So it was very subjective. Um, yeah, I feel I think Smith might have just 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 nicked the round though in that twelfth. So for me, I had it a draw on my card. But as you can see, the Ryder rounds that I scored, the, the ones that I scored to Ryder, you couldn't argue with them. You know, they were clear Ryder rounds, but. There was a lot of close rounds, and for me, most of the close rounds, Callum Smith nicked. So that's why I had it a draw, but I don't feel like he deserved to lose John Ryder. I'm, I'm obviously absolutely gutted for him. He's a good friend of the show. I really, really like John Ryder. He's a, he's a real cool, you know, humble, genuine guy. You know, he's an all-round athlete. He's, I've said it before, he is the most improved fighter in boxing. Him and Tevin Farmer, both up there in the same bracket. Um... But yeah, you know, I was I was I was gutted for John. I was really gutted. He certainly didn't deserve to lose on that, you know, that scorecard that Terry O'Connor handed in. He, you know, Terry O'Connor gave him three rounds. That is absolutely abysmal. Um but yeah, you know, the rounds were so subjective, you know, they were so they were they were toss up rounds. I actually spoke to Craig Richards after the fight, and obviously Craig Craig Richards is is a you know, a gym mate of John Ryder. They spar all the time you know they're real good friends and I said to him it's funny Craig because I was looking at Andy Lee's scorecard and every round he seemed to be giving to Ryder I was giving to Smith and every round he gave to Smith I was giving to Ryder and he said I I 100% agree with you I almost thought like Andy Lee had his scorecard round the wrong way so <laughs> you know what I mean it, it is so crazy because because you'd probably think my scoring was a bit harsh especially in the early rounds after what did I say after seven rounds I'd only given Ryder one but um you know, even Craig Richards agreed that Smith got the better of the early rounds, and I think he he uh, he let it go in the in the second half where John started to take over. But yeah, absolutely gutted for John. Nothing else really I can say. I just hope he gets another shot. The rematch should happen, though. I do think that Callum Smith would look at John Ryder and say, "Well, you know, going into this fight here, he probably thought, well, he got knocked out by Nick Blackwell, he got beat on points by Billy Joe Saunders, he lost to Rocky Fielding, who I banged out in a round." You know, he can say that he prepared as good as what he says, but I, I just think mentally, if you if you don't have that fear factor that I didn't think he'd have, then you can let it slip. And Callum Smith, for me, is a guy that fights to his opponent's level. We've seen him look absolutely dreadful when he fights, you know, someone of real low low opposition, you know. Hasn't hasn't really happened lately because he's been stepping it up, but before he became world champion, when he was in those you know, in, in those few months or or you know, it's about however long they they made him wait for a title shot, he didn't look that great in a lot of those fights, you know. He he was just kind of unmotivated, his mind wasn't really there. He was winning of course, but he just didn't look his destructive self, you know? And and for me this was, you know, a step down, really, in terms of, like, the Groves fight, 
Um, you know, the the Ndam fight was obviously out in the States. There's probably a bit more excitement there. And Dam being a former world champion a couple of times. You know, that there's just something there. But with John Ryder, I, unfortunately, I just don't think he brings that fear factor. I don't think he he um, perhaps took him as serious as a threat as he would have his, his last few opponents. And that is, in my opinion, why we saw a bit of a lackluster performance from Smith. Again, I had it a draw. Um... I hope John Ryder gets another shot, and I think if the rematch does happen, then Callum Smith is going to take it much more serious, and I think he, he probably does better in the, in the in the second fight because now he knows how how good John Ryder is. Um, but yeah, that's it really from me on that one. Moving down that undercard um, and trying to get for it a little bit quicker. Uh, let's talk about. James Tennyson, he was able to TKO in the 11th round, Craig Evans. Evans was actually down in the first round, um, but yeah, a, a good win there for James Tennyson. That one was a bit of a kind of 50-50 fight on paper, great fight. Um, Craig Glover, 10-2 and two going in, now 10-3. and three. He was TKO'd in five rounds by Chris Billum smith It was for the vacant Commonwealth Cruiserweight title. Glover was down once in the fourth round and twice in that fifth round. I felt like after the first knockdown in the fifth round, they probably shouldn't have let him carry on. I felt like he took a few punches he didn't need to take. Um, Chris Billum smith I mean... He he was just too good for him, you know. I expected him to get Craig Glover out of there around about the early slash mid rounds, and he did. Um, you know, for me, Craig Glover was actually saved by the bell in the first knockdown, you know, in the in the prior rounds. So just a level above, really, Chris Billum Smith. Lots and lots of promise. I mean, he lost the fight to React Poor, but I can't remember what happened in that fight. But it was really close or something, wasn't it? So uh, I'd like to see a rematch there or something, or you know, get the other names in. Where's Isaac Chamberlain? I've got no idea where he's where he's disappeared to. Um, you know, the likes obviously Wadi Camacho is retired now, but there's a few guys there knocking around at cruiserweight. It's a decent division domestically. Obviously, you got Luke the Duke Watkins. I want to see these fights. Um, Moving down the card once again, Anthony Fowler was able to win a unanimous decision over 10 against Harry Scarf. Harry Scarf loses his O. Um, very wide in the end to Fowler. Scarf was down in the ninth round. It was for the vacant WBA International Super Welterweight title. Um, yeah, like I say, quite wide in the end there for Anthony Fowler. Um, also on the bill, Tom Farrell, 17-2 and two going in against Sean Masher Dodd, 16-5 and five with one draw going in. Um, yeah, Tom Farrell was actually cut on the forehead, I think it was. It was an accidental head clash and um, you know, they stopped it and it went to the cards and Sean Masha Dodd actually got it. So, um, yeah, technical decision win there for, for Masha Dodd. Also on the bill, I should mention Stephen Smith, the brother, of course, of Callum. He picked up a win now, 28-4. and four. It was a points win over six against Johnny Phillips, who's now 5-3. and three. Bit of a mismatch there. Um, moving out now to Germany at the Arena Berlin. We have over here just one fight to mention. Jack Kalkai picked up a win now, 27-4. and four. It was for the WBO International Super Welterweight title against the previously undefeated 16-0 and 0, Jama Saidi. Now 16-1, and 1, of course. Um, like I say, unanimous decision over 12 there for Kalkai. It seems like last week, or last weekend, was, um, was a weekend where lots and lots of undefeated records were, were being taken away. Um, going out now, though, to the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California, USA. Um, a fight where, you know, it was a big fight. It was a world title fight, but not many people were that interested. Friend of the show, Andrew Cancio, a guy that, of course, retired, went back to his normal job. His kids convinced him to return to boxing. And when he returned, he won a world title. He rematched Rene Alvarado, a guy that he knocked out about three years ago. Anyway, it was for Cancio's WBA World Super Featherweight title. And actually, he was retired on his store after seven rounds. Rene Alvarado turned up and he really, really, really shown up there. Um, unbelievable performance, actually. He started battering um, a Cancio around the ring. I mean, Cancio was cut on his left eye in round three. And um, yeah, it was all Alvarado. He absolutely dominated the fight. I think he won... Like every single round, he might have lost perhaps one, but he absolutely dominated. Um, I think since the first fight, both men have, 
you know, moved up in weight. I think they've moved up one weight class and they've really, really improved. But you'd, you'd have had to said Cancio got the knockout last time. Cancio's now gone on to become a world champion. So for me, he was a massive favourite. It was almost a, a no-risk kind of defence for him. But just goes to show how wrong you can be in boxing. Rene Alvarado, the new WBA world super featherweight champion, of course, with a record of 32 and 8. You know, he'd be looked at with his eight losses as an easy way to become a world champion. But perhaps not if you if you actually sit and watch that fight. He was sensational. On that undercard, Kan Zhu, um, I think he became something like the... the uh, he's broke some kind of record. I think he's like the, uh, the guy to throw the most punches in a 12-round fight. I think he's like... I think he's. I don't think he's. He's done the most punches. I think he's like fourth or fifth in the list. It was well over a thousand punches. It was a defense of his WBA World Featherweight title against Manny Robles the third. Again, he was undefeated. He had his O taken. So many O's being taken. Kanzu now eighteen and two. Very wide on the cards for him. A shutout on one card. Uh, moving out now to the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada. The final bill to mention. Let's start with the undercard. Um, Marcellus Wilder, the brother of Deontay, he was KO'd in four rounds by Dustin Long. Um, he had a record of 2-1 and one with two draws. And he knocked out Marcellus Wilder with a left hand that didn't even look like a big shot. And Marcellus Wilder was absolutely out of it. Um, he should probably just hang him up. His record's now 5-2. and two. Dustin Long, I think he's he's like an MMA fighter or something. He's not even a real boxer. He's now 3-1 and one with two draws. Um, on the undercard also, we saw Ledwan Barthelemy. He had his O taken as well. For me, it was an upset. 15-0 um, and 0 with one draw going in. He was TKO'd in four rounds by Eduardo Ramirez. Now 23-2 and two with three draws. Um, like I say, a, a good fight, a good performance from Ramirez. The knockdown was nice and um, a big upset there, in my opinion. Also on the bill, Leo Santa Cruz now 37-1 and one with one draw. He becomes the new WBA Super World Super Featherweight Champion. Um, that makes him a four-weight world champion. It was a quite a wide win, really, against Miguel Flores, friend of the show. I wanted to see him do really well. Um, you know, he was very competitive, though. You know, the cards perhaps don't really tell the full story. He's a tough guy, Flores. He showed up with his heart, as we expected. But unfortunately, it just wasn't enough for him. So 24-3, and three, his record now. He can hopefully come again. Um, hey, perhaps he, he can fight... Um, Perhaps he can fight uh, Rene Alvarado. I'd like to see that fight. Um, I doubt he'll get the shot, though. And also on that bill, Brandon Figueroa, a friend of the show. Again, he was undefeated. He is still undefeated, but he's got a minor blemish. It ended up being a split draw over 12 rounds against Julio Seja. Obviously, Seja, a guy that was beating Rigondo in his last fight till he got knocked out. It was for Figueroa's WBA World Super Bantamweight title. The belt that he got, um, you know, he got awarded, really. He was the interim champion. Then he got elevated to the full champion. He made his first defense here, and it was a draw. Um, Seja actually came in, though. I think it was something like four and a half pounds overweight. I couldn't believe the fight still went ahead. Credit to Brandon Figueroa for doing that, and um, he's basically said that if Seha came in, um, you know, came in on weight, then he'd have won, and I think he's got a strong point there, but credit to Figueroa showing that Figueroa heart, um, you know, he still wanted the fight, and I think he's a little bit crazy, but we love that about boxers, and he is a true gentleman, I really got a lot of time for Brandon Figueroa, a young guy with an incredibly bright future, but the main event I has, Deontay Wilder now 42-0, and of course he's got that one minor blemish, that draw, and it was a KO for him in seven rounds against the Cuban Luis Ortiz, now 31-2, and the second time they've met, the second time it's ended with a knockout win for Wilder in a fight that he's been well behind in the cards, well, on many cards, not everyone's, unbelievably. And like I say, Wilder got a defence there of his WBC World Heavyweight crown. Talk me for it. It was another Wilder. It was another Wilder performance. Obviously, we saw Wilder going. We saw Wilder losing the rounds from first to seventh, and obviously, when, when the right hand came and knocked him out, um, uh, knocked Luis Ortiz out. Obviously, we've seen Wilder in all of his fights. He's always. He's always behind the cards, but somehow he just gets that knock, that that huge knockout power, and just knocks people out. Obviously, um, now obviously February twenty second, they say it's the rematch of Tyson Fury. Um, that's the only fight I'm looking forward to. But I mean, it's another Wilder performance. Loses the round, uh, loses all the rounds, come from behind, and then bam, one right hand, finish, game over. 
Yeah, I mean, the first round for me in Altis round, um, he found one or two backhands, but nothing too serious. Wilder didn't really do anything. He was just pouring with a jab as he does. Um, it was a nothing round, but definitely an Ortiz round. You know, Ortiz seemed to, I think, have a cut as well on, on his hairline somewhere. Uh, the commentary team didn't initially pick, pick, pick it up. They didn't see it. Um, the second round, again, another round you'd have to say Ortiz won. Wilder just wasn't letting the right hand go at all. Um, again, he was just pouring with a jab. Looked a little bit lost in there. Ortiz not really overexerting himself at that point. It was good stuff. Neither man was really burning too much energy. The third round, another good round for Ortiz. He started to let the backhand go a few times to the body of Wilder. I liked that tactic as well. Um, you know, he was completely outboxing the champion after three. And as most of Wilder's fights start off, to be honest, you know, he doesn't always let that right hand go. And again, we saw that against Fury. I think when he's boxing, you know, a master boxer, he doesn't really want to, you know, overextend. He doesn't want to get countered. So he doesn't let that right hand go. He just waits for his moment. And um, round four, another round for all tiers. Wilder's right hand, uh, he tried to get through with it a couple of times, but they were being blocked. Again, he was easily outboxed by Ortiz. The fifth round, again, Ortiz won the round, though Wilder did land one or two nice shots. He was being outworked by Ortiz. Then uh, round six, another round for Ortiz. I was almost starting to think, was Wilder trying to let the old man tire out and come on, perhaps, you know, later in the fight? Um, you know, is Wilder even capable of following the game plan of that depth? But then in the seventh round, the very next round, boom, you know, the right hand came in and it absolutely knocked the sweat off of Ortiz's head. Um, but yeah, you're right, I has a typical Wilder performance in which he was being outclassed for every second of the fight, but then he lands that, that, that money shot and ends it all right there. You know, we've seen it time and time again. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's a little bit frustrating, I suppose. I mean, I'm not a Wilder hater, because I actually think he's all right as a person. But it's just so annoying watching his fights, because he, he you know, his tech... I don't care what anyone says. Some people are trying to say this is wrong, what I'm about to say, but his technique is awful. His footwork is awful. His jab, he just pours with it. He loses every single round in most of his fights. You know, someone was saying it the other day. Is there another world champion in history that's lost that many rounds but is still undefeated? Probably not. You know, he got, you know, he was losing to Spilka. He was losing to, uh, to, um, to um, Gerald Washington, obviously Fury. You know, it's happened time and time again. Ortiz in both the fights. He is quite terrible when it comes to, you know, boxing IQ boxing just just basic boxing basics you know he he just doesn't have them in his locker but he's always able to find that shot so you can't take that away from him and because of that he is one of the best heavyweights in the world for me he's probably number two behind fury i think fury proved when he beat wilder in the first fight there that um you know that he's the number one obviously joshua's lost to ruiz so Ruiz deserves a bit of a shout in the top few as well, but obviously he lost to Parker, but that one could have gone either way. So Ruiz is right up there, by the way. But um, right now, for me, the actual heavyweight rankings from one to four, honestly, if I'm being completely honest, number one, Fury, number two, um, Deontay Wilder, number three, Ruiz, and number four, Joshua. That is honestly how I see it. So, um, yeah, hopefully we get to see a little bit more, um, more, what's the word, closure, I suppose, if that's the right word anyway, on February 22nd, should the fight actually go ahead, not that long to go, and um, hopefully we see a rightful winner, we don't want to see a draw, we don't want to see any controversy, hopefully Fury gets the win, and then everyone will agree, it will be unanimous that he's the best fighter in the world, you know, at, at heavyweight, but yeah, just again, on the predictions, we didn't get to see the uh, the, the Neary and the Rodriguez fight, obviously Neary came in overweight, Rodriguez didn't agree to the fight going ahead in the end, even if he was given some kind of financial uh, extra or whatever, so um, yeah, that, that fight didn't end up happening, so that prediction got struck off, but the other prediction, of course, we all backed Wilder to get the knockout, we all thought he'd do pretty much the same thing, and he did, so two points gained for myself, of course, for getting the Smith uh, the Smith points prediction right, and of course you you and the listeners, I, has both gained a point there with the Wilder KO, but that is it for the review part of the show. Just before we wrap up part one, the final thing to do is to welcome our very first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the reigning IBF and WBA super, super bantamweight champion of the world. It is, of course, the baby-faced assassin, Mr. Daniel Roman. Daniel, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Joey. I'm 
I'm happy to be uh, interviewed by you. <laughs> Thank you. So, Danny, I want to start with, with a typical opener, really. Um, how did you get into boxing in the very beginning? What's your earliest memories of putting on the gloves? <laughs> I, well, we all started, uh, I was back in, uh, in school. I was uh, seven years old, and I was uh, playing uh, football. And you know how, how kids are. and So one thing led to another. I got beat up, came home crying. And at that time, my cousin and my brother were boxing. So my dad sent me with my uncle to learn how to box. He told me, you got to learn how to de- defend yourself. And that's, it. that's how it all started. I didn't have no idea about boxing until the first day that I started doing it. And did you ever have like an inspiration? Like, did anyone inspire you to get into boxing? Any any boxing figures? You know, back when you were young. Mm, there, there's a lot of fighters. After uh, I started getting into the sport, I started like you know, I got to know more about this sport. I started doing my research. I remember uh, searching on uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Roberto Duran, as uh, especially uh, Julio Cesar Chavez Senior, and. Uh, all these upcoming fighters, uh, Shiri Shane Mosby. So there's a lot of fighters that motivated me. So, you know what? Uh, I want to keep on doing this. I want to start to like this sport. And did you have much of an amateur career, Daniel? Y- yes, I did. I did. Uh, I started uh, my um, even my first fight. Uh, right when I turned eight years old, uh, I started uh, my amateur career. So I was uh, 17. I did uh, 70 fights. Okay. Uh, just 10 losses out of the 70. Nice, nice. And of course, you turned pro in, in 2010. But, um, you know, it wasn't a perfect start to your pro career. I mean, after your first four fights, you'd you'd won two fights, you'd lost one and drew one. I mean, the draw was a split draw. The, the loss was a split decision loss. Did you feel hard done by on the scorecards on those occasions? Or were you just simply not perhaps good enough back in back you know back when that happened well um well be, before um turning pro uh right when i turned on um, 17 i was uh my, my goal was to try out for the 2008 olympics i think it was beijing beijing china yep. so that happened i lost at the western trials and and i didn't want nothing to do with boxing so i left like a year a year passed by you know not even interesting, but I had that fire in me, you know, the love for the sport. So little by little, I started uh, getting back to the gym. And after that, like, you know what, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try this professional thing, you know, because I, ne- I never thought about being a professional. My goal was just to be an Olympic medalist. And from there on, I would have seen where it led me to. But like uh, my first fight, uh, it only lasted, I believe, 40 seconds, 45 seconds. I knocked the guy out with a with a liver shot. And uh the second fight, uh well, it was it was you could say my welcome to the professional. It was a it was a tough fight. Uh it was a close fight and uh it, it became a draw. And uh my first loss, uh it was another tough fight. Uh it, it could have gone either way, you know, but I got I got beat. Hmm. And, you know, because cause you are, when you look back at that, you know, the start you had was a bit of a rocky start there. And then to, to, you know, to see that and then to see what you're achieving now, it's just unbelievable. I love speaking to people like yourself, like your Tevin Farmers, people like that, that didn't have the best starts and then have gone on. You know, it's just, it's brilliant hearing people and how they've improved, not just their boxing, but, you know, their whole life. And um, I'm guessing you must have been able to spar some biggish names over the years. Who who are some of the big names uh, you've perhaps you know mixed Ooh. it with? <laughs> oh man, I gotta I gotta start making memory. Uh, well, one of the biggest names now uh, I sparred uh, Leo Santa Cruz. Oh wow, he just fought uh, over the weekend. Yeah. Um, I sparred uh, Abner Mares. <laughs> you're making what? You're making me go back way back. <laughs> No, that's okay. That's that's two big names. There. Some upcoming, uh, um, some upcoming uh, uh, prospects. Uh, Arona Alameda, a uh, Mexican fighter. Um, um, what's his name? Jesse, uh, Jesse Magdaleno. I sparred him. Wow, wow man, I sparred. 
<laughs> you know what? They don't they don't go up to my mind. But yeah, I I've been in the ring sparring with a uh, some pretty uh, famous guy. <laughs> now that's some great names mm-hmm. there. And you know, fast forwarding, obviously, you know, you got your shot in the end against Sh- against Shun Kubo. You know, you had to you had to travel to Japan for it. Now he was undefeated at the time. You were able to stop the champion in the ninth round. I watched it back today. I mean, you were completely all over him, especially in in you know coming up to that that eighth and ninth round stuff like that. The pressure you put on was incredible. Um, just talk me through that fight from your point of view, because like I say, you really dominated the undefeated champion, and you completely silenced the crowd. Yes, oh uh, boy. Uh, Japan is uh <laughs> is really different, uh, different culture. I mean, uh, you know, usually in the fights you hear a lot of people screaming. They're like, at some point they were like quiet, you know, just looking at the fights. But they're good people. They're good people. They treated me good. Uh, got a love, a lot of love and respect for them. The fight of. Uh, uh, I remember after I uh, I beat uh, Adam Lopez for the title eliminator. Uh, at that time, um, Sermeño was champion, and he was going to fight Sean Kubo. That's how Sean Kubo became the, the world champion, because he beat uh, Sermeño. So, like, we we're, were wondering, you know, oh, man, uh, it got to happen this year. It got to happen uh, this year. We started getting ready. Started uh, preparing the like we always do for for the best. And uh, well, Sean Kubo, we knew he was a tall guy, lefty, and um, so we had to take the fight at hand. And um, we, I, I couldn't let him uh, use his distance because every time he used his distance, he was uh, connecting me. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be on top of him, try to break him down, and and that's how we're gonna beat him and. Thank God everything went great. The plan went great, and uh, we can we like we dropped them. I believe in the was it an eight or seven round. Yeah. And and after that we started um, picking up the pace. And uh, once we saw that he was hurt, you know, I was like, you know what, it it, it, it could be any moment. This this is my dream. This is what I've been fighting all my life for. So I I got to take advantage of it, and and thank God that's what I did. And, Everything went great, and I became a, a champion that night. And just describe to me what what that felt like. You know what that felt like. Perhaps you, you know, the, the minute the referee waved it off, you knew. But just hearing, obviously, you know, the announcement, the new champion of the world. What what went through you at that moment there? Oh, Joey, man, it is. Uh, <laughs> you can't explain it because because it's, it's really really emotional. You know, like you remember all the all you've been through. I remember the the two losses that I had early in my career. I was like, you know what, I'm a world champion tonight. I'm a world champion today, and I mean, anything's possible. Anything, anything's possible. You set your mind to it, and you put in the work for it. And uh, but yeah, I I uh, I couldn't hold my emotions. I, I was crying right there. Was, uh, everything I've been through, everything came through, and and it was that joy. It was that joy, like you. I I can't explain it. <laughs> can't explain the joy. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, the best feeling. Sometimes I like to just ask that that uh, that question to a few guys that have won world titles, <laughs> and I just I just I sit here smiling while they try to explain to a normal person like me what it's like to uh, to win a world title. <laughs> but um, of course, you then defended against Matsumoto. You then took the O um, f- from Moises Flores, and then of course you beat Britain's very own Gavin McDonnell. Um, what was that Gavin McDonnell mm-hmm. fight? like now looking back I mean I'm not gonna lie I was sitting here cheering for McDonald but you fought brilliantly that night and of course <laughs> you know was the rightful winner I mean uh, uh, another uh, tall fighter uh, Gavin McDonald uh, great boxing um, I knew he was uh, boxing he wasn't staying there to exchange with me he kept on uh, moving around he, he was in a smart fight so like uh, you know what I was like you know what I, I got a I gotta, I gotta keep on pressuring him because uh, I know he's not an easy fighter, but I gotta, I gotta do my best. You know, I, I even uh, it was my first fight under uh, Matchroom. It was my first fight under Matchroom, and uh, I know he came in the best shape because he looked fit. 
<laughs> Gavin looks fit. And um, first started, uh, I started connecting him to the body. He, he was so tall, so I started like, you know what, I'm going to start breaking this guy down. Started through combinations. And um, eventually uh, I saw that uh, he wasn't moving as much later in the round. So I was like, oh, you know what, uh, I'm starting to get him more starting to connect more and, and and yeah and it happened I believe in the 10th round right yeah yeah it was in the 10th round right yeah 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 sorry yeah yeah yeah. D- did we stop him? yeah yeah no you know brilliant fight that like I say brilliant fight and you know obviously Gavin you know boxed really well as well up to that point um mm-hmm. Most recently, of course, the big one back in April, unification against the IBF world champion TJ Doheny, um, you know, in which you were able to dethrone him and become a unified champion by dropping him twice and, of course, grabbing a majority decision win. We've seen so many brilliant fights this year, you know, like Spence Porter, Pro Gray Taylor, Inoue Donaire, Joshua Ruiz, and they're all being spoken about as potential fight of the year contenders but because your fight happened back in April I feel like a lot of people are almost forgetting it because in my opinion it certainly does deserve a mention as, as one of the best fights of 2019 oh of, of course you know I, I even that I even thought me and uh, TJ took that night yeah. the fight of the night uh, TJ man I, tough guy man TJ Woo. Uh, I got a lot of respect for him um he did the same thing as I did. He went over to Ch- to Japan, won the world title, and uh, he's a um, strong kid, strong guy. Um, he gave a good fight. He even connected me in the seventh round. <laughs> but yeah, he was a um, great guy, a great fighter, and um, yeah, I-, I think he was. He should be spoken as one of the. Fights of the year, at least, you know, because uh, we gave it all that night. Yeah, you certainly both did. And um, how are you feeling now, obviously, as the unified champion at 122? Because people can say whoever they want to say is the best fighter at 122. Some people might not think you're the number one. But one thing that no one can deny is that you've got the real estate. You've got the two major, uh, you know, the two of the major four titles. That puts you in a special position. No one can deny that at all. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not the ones that uh, the, the type of guy that, that talks a lot. You know, <laughs> I'd rather talk in the ring. But yeah, like having uh, having two world titles, uh, she means something. She say something that like I, I believe I'm I'm the best at one one twenty two super banner way. I think I'm I'm the best at that uh, division, and um uh, and I'm um, still gonna prove it. You know, I, there's um uh, this, this fight coming up. With uh, this uh, uh, Uzbekistan kid, Mur- Murojan, and um, hopefully everything goes well on this fight, and um, we'll be going for the rest of the world titles, challenging the the best in the division. And you you named your opponent there. When, when is that fight set for? If if you can tell us at this stage. Well, um, I I believe I'll be by the end of uh, uh next year or the January beginning of next year and the, by the end of uh, January and is that a, is that a mandatory e, yeah yes for the, the WBA okay 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 so um you know you, again you mentioned there your plan is quite simple to to you know defend against your mandatory then you look to to make the big fights in the division obviously the two other champions Navarrete and Ray Vargas um what do you think of those yeah. guys as champions i mean Ray Vargas obviously you know another guy we've seen in there with Gavin McDonald a real good boxer um it seems massive for the weight and then Navarrete perhaps even bigger for the weight you know huge at the weight i mean he looked massive against Dog Bay um those two guys are huge, Danny. What do you think of those two champions there? Oh, I mean, uh, I fought uh, <laughs> taller guys than me. Even um, one of the latest ones, it was uh, it was Gavin. Yeah, Gavin, Moises Flores, uh, real Matsumoto. They're pretty tall guys, you know. You just you just got to make the adjustment, the you the right preparation for those type of guys. But yeah, they're they're like. Ray Vargas, uh, he's proven that uh, he's a great champion. He got uh, four or five defense on the WBC. 
in uh, Navarrete, I believe he got three, one on four, I believe. So they they proven themselves, you know. And uh, I I called out um, both of them, and uh, Ray Vargas has called me as well. So you know, hopefully, uh, it, it could happen by this coming year. Yeah, we certainly hope. Twenty twenty. So. We certainly hope so. And uh, just coming down to the last couple of questions, really, Danny. Um, I'm asking everyone this one: Joshua versus Ruiz, the rematch, putting you on the spot a little bit. Obviously, on the zone, how do you see it unfolding? Is it repeat? Will Ruiz win again, or will Joshua uh, get his revenge and win this one? You know what? Uh, to be honest, at that weight, heavyweight, anything can happen. <laughs> it's a fifty-fifty. I mean, uh, both of the guys got the power. To finish the punch with one. Uh, I mean, finish the fight with one punch. And uh, I'm actually pretty interested on this fight. So I know um, what happened on the first fight. It was um, it was a pretty good fight, you know. Um, with his name, uh, Reeves got dropped. Then he came back strong and finished off uh, Joshua. You know, he could have been on this fight as well. But like I said, it it's a fifty-fifty. Anything can happen at that weight. Both of them got the power to change the fight with one punch. Let 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 the let the best man win, and for me, I just want to see a great fight. Okay, okay. I let I let you sit on the fence, <laughs> and uh, and just just the final real question, Danny. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit once again. Um, I like to ask this question to all of our you know our, the people that I interview from from all over the world. Who who comes to mind yes. when you when I ask you who is your favorite UK fighter? It can be from any era. It can be a guy still fighting today. It can be a guy who retired many years ago. Who comes to mind? I want to say uh, Ricky Haddon. Okay, yeah, very popular answer. What did you like about Ricky? <laughs> yeah, man, he's, he's, he reminds me of uh, Durant. He had that aggressive style, you know, coming forward, doing everything. Just a tough guy, man. Yeah, like I say, very popular answer. A lot of people love the hit, man. Yeah. And just, just finally, Danny. Again, you know, you've you've, you've signed with Eddie, or you're, you're fighting on the zone. We're getting to see you over here on Sky Sports. A lot of the UK support for you has, I'm sure, really increased um, because of because of all of this. What's your message to your UK supporters that support you over here? If you've got a final message for them that support you this side of the pond. Oh yes, of course, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. You know, I'm happy. I, I got a. Good uh, fan base in uh, UK, and thank you all for your support. Thank you for that love, and um, for coming this uh, 2020. Uh, expect uh, great, good things from me. Um, sorry from the little setbacks, the little injuries, but it, it's boxing, you know. It happens, but and unfortunately, it happened to me. You know, um, we'll be we'll be strong uh, upcoming 2020, and and thank you again for that love and uh, respect you guys have given me and. Uh, I will continue giving the best of me and giving great fights. Absolutely. Listen, Danny, it has been a total pleasure interviewing you this week, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Best of luck with the upcoming fight. Have a great Christmas, and I'm sure that we'll catch up sometime in the new year. Yes. Thank you, Joy, and uh, happy holidays, and uh, take care. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. Usually, of course, we do the news, but there isn't really anything big enough to mention as it stands. But if that changes by the end of the show, I will discuss it at the very end. But as as it stands, nothing really worth mentioning. So let's dive straight into the preview part. We're going to start here at the Casino di Monte Carlo in, of course, Monaco, the Eddie Hearn um, annual Monte Carlo showdown Um over here we have Huey Fury, 23 and 3. He's in a 10 rounder against um, Pavel Soar, who's got a record of 11 and 2. Um, the losses came to Jermaine Franklin in his very last fight, which unbelievably happened a month ago. He went the distance and got almost shut out um, over 10 rounds literally a month ago. That is quite shocking. In in in, uh, in in October, he, he lost. He was down as well twice in the fight, and he's back the, the month after against Huey Fury. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. He also got knocked out by Philip Hergovic in one round. Um, 
also on the bill Zalil Zhang, the uh, the Chinese heavyweight, the uh, the silver medalist in the Olympic six foot six southpaw. Real stop start career it's been for him. He needs to really get going. I think he's quite up there in age as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, anyway, he is twenty and zero with sixteen KOs. He was supposed to be fighting. Uh, the guy that Michael Hunter beat, um, Sergei Kuzmin. He was supposed to be fighting him, but for whatever reason, for whatever reason, Kuzmin's not fighting him. And in steps Andre Rodenko, former opponent of Huey Fury. That one's for the WBO Oriental Heavyweight Title. Rodenko, thirty-two and four. Um, again, he's coming off a loss as well to Ajit Kabayel. Oh boy, oh boy. He's only had um, one fight. Per year, actually, for the last three years, Rodenko. Um, so, yeah, not good. Really not good. So, two home fighters there, both fighting guys coming off losses. Um, also on the bill, Cecilia Brackhouse, arguably the pound-for-pound pound number one of women's boxing. 35-0. and 0. She puts her WBC, WBA, IBF, WBO, and IBO world female welterweight titles on the line against... The very game, um, Victoria Bustos, 19-5. and five. Um, Bustos, she's tough. She's never been stopped, but she's not a big puncher. She's never knocked anyone out, you know, which is kind of crazy. You know, she went the distance with Katie Taylor, got beat very wide. Um, you know, that one was down at 135, and she's stepped right up here to 147. It makes no real sense to me, but I'm, I'm guessing Brackhouse is going to be too big. She's going to probably look good over 10 two-minute rounds there. Also on the bill, Alexander Besputin, 13-0, and fights for the vacant WBA World Welterweight title against Rakab Butaev, who has a record of 12-0, and 9 KOs. Butaev, I think, was, was a decent amateur, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Yeah, having a look at it now, actually. 400 amateur fights, 392 wins, 164 KOs. That's incredible. So, um, <laughs> boy, oh boy, I'd like to see the odds on that one. And obviously, Alexander Besputin, another good fighter, another good fighter, another guy with, you know, a real extensive amateur career and stuff like that. Did he go to the Olympics? Did he go to the Olympics? I can't remember now, but he was a good amateur. I remember that. Um, so, two two good amateurs getting it on in the pros, 13 and against 11 and 0 both men with 9 KOs um, and also on that bill almost forgot there Joe Cordina the Welsh wizard he fights for the vacant WBA continental super featherweight title against Mario Enrique Tenoco you may know him because earlier this year it was back in May he was able to stop and take the O of Jordan Gill yes it is him obviously he's got the loss to Devin Haney he's got a loss down there to Mario Barrios and a couple of others but you know he showed us against Jordan Gill, who I think had the flu and stuff like that. Um, you know, he showed us that he's he's not a bad fighter. He's a tough guy, and he can punch as well. So this should be a stern test there for Joe Cordina. Uh, moving out now to Spain at the Pabellón de la Val de Hebron or something there in Barcelona, Catalonia. Over here we get to see Kerman Leharaga return to the ring. 28-2, and two, of course, the two losses to the same man, David Avanesian. He takes on Anderson Clayton. 41-14 and 14 with two draws over eight rounds. Leharaga will absolutely destroy him, in my opinion. Uh, moving out now to York Hall. Again, this one takes place this Saturday also. Um, over here, quite a Quite a few good fights, actually. I'm going to just go through these real quick. This one for the vacant English super featherweight title. 9-0 and undefeated. Liam Dillon takes on Yusuf Kamari over 10 rounds. Kamari 10-0. and um, Shout out to Kamari, by the way. I think trained by Xavier um, out of that. I think they're still operating out of that. Don Charles, Jim. Good guy. Xavier. Uh, also on the bill, Echo Esseman, 12-0. and um, He takes on Curtis Felix Jr., 10-0. and That one for the English welterweight title. Um, Linus Eudofia, 14-0. and Fights for the vacant English middleweight title against Tyler Denny, 12-1 and with two draws. Um, who else is on that bill? Uh, Mo Garib, 5-1. and He takes on Lee Devine over four rounds. Um, yeah, that's about it really for that one. Moving out now to the Oasis Leisure Center in Swindon, Wiltshire, United Kingdom. Friend of the show, Luke the Duke Watkins, 14 and 2. He takes on Eric Nazarian, who's 27 and 23 with four draws. That's an eight rounder there. Um, 
Let's let's just go to the big uh, Frank Warren card. A brilliant, brilliant build. This, by the way, I think it starts. Don't 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 uh, take this f for gospel, but check it out. I think it starts at six p.m. on the telecast, so it's a very early start on Saturday. Um, let's start with the undercard, shall we? Um, Dennis McCam, obviously the 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 the, the Cam man, the menace. I think they call him Dennis the Menace. Four and zero, very very good fighter. Um, huge huge future, you'd say. He's in a six rounder, no opponent just yet. Um, Shabazz Masood, six and zero. He's in a six rounder against Stefan Nikolai, three and nineteen with a draw. Hamza Shiraz, nine and zero. He fights for the vacant WBO European Super Welterweight title. No opponent just yet there. Over ten. Also on the bill, Sammy Maxwell, 12-0. and 0. Um, He's in a, a good fight, actually. It's for the WBO European Super Lightweight title. He takes on another undefeated guy, Connor Parker, 12-0 and 0 as well. Um, that could be interesting, you know. He's a southpaw, 5-9 Connor Parker. Again, it seems like lots and lots of undefeated guys last weekend and this weekend are all getting it on, you know, someone is going to lose their O, it seems like O's are going in the month of November um, Lerone Richards, 12-0, and 0, takes on another one here, takes on takes on Lennox Clark, 19-0 and 0 with a draw that one's for the vacant British super middleweight title, that's a cracking fight by the way Lennox Clark, a guy who if I'm not mistaken, I think he's, has he been a touch inactive or something, because I haven't seen him really since the the fight with um, Jermaine Smile, I think it was. I think he beat Jermaine Smile. And, um, you know, it, it was a good fight. I think I may have even been there for that one. And, you know, since then, it seems like he hasn't pushed on. And I was actually quite surprised to see he's still undefeated. Obviously, Lerone Richards, a guy who's been plagued also with inactivity. You know, he's, he's coming off that brilliant win earlier this year against Tommy Langford. That one will be really interesting. Um... What else do we have? Chris Jenkins, 22 and 3 with two draws, takes on Liam Taylor, 21 and 1. Um, again, Chris Jenkins seems like he's just, you know, he's, he's, he's had a couple of ups and downs, obviously. Um, you know, but that fight against Johnny Garton, I thought Garton would be able to walk through him, and he boxed absolutely brilliantly, became British champion, defended it against Paddy Gallagher, and here he is against Liam Taylor, who can fight himself, you know. Liam Taylor hasn't lost for about four and four and a bit years, maybe even five years now. I think it was to Tyrone Nurse back in the day on on an under was it on an under it was an, on an undercard of something. It was on an undercard of something that might have been a Josh Warrington undercard up in Leeds. Um but yeah, you know, very good fight that one. Sam Bowen again, this is another guy willing to risk his O. Fifteen and O. He puts his British super featherweight title on the line against Anthony Kakachi, seventeen and one. A lot of people are telling me that Kakachi will win that fight. So that one could be very interesting. Again, Kakachi with that one loss to Martin uh, Martin J. Ward. You know, again he's been a little bit inactive. Only the one fight in the last almost two years, you know, so he's coming off real inactivity there, but that one could be interesting, um, and then of course, topping the bill for the WBO World Bantamweight title, Zolani Tete, 28-3, and three. he takes on John Real Casemiro, 28-4, and four. obviously Casemiro, the last time he stepped foot in the UK was when he, when he, when he took the O and stopped Charlie Edwards in that 10th round on the Brooke Golovkin undercard back in, was it 2015 or 2016 that was? Um, so yeah, tremendous fighter. It's great to have him back in this country. Um, that's it for that card, though. Again, I think it starts at 6 on Saturday there. This one takes place in the States at the Cosmopolitan of Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. Um, over here, we get to see Arnold Barboza Jr., 22-0. He takes on William Silva, 27-2, over 10 rounds there for the NABF Junior Super Lightweight title. And Oscar Valdez, 26-0. He makes his debut at 130 pounds, a super featherweight division. Obviously, he vacated his WBO featherweight title. Shakur Stevenson's picked it up. He's in a 10-rounder against Andres Gutierrez 38 and 2 with one draw. Um am I mistaken Andres Gutierrez for someone else? Wasn't he was he a guy Ayers, who was supposed to box Carl Frampton? Yes, that's correct, but then um wasn't it something he slipped in a bathroom? Was that him? Yeah, 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 you're right. Yes, yeah. that was him and then yeah. the fight got cancelled. What a weird one. So uh yeah, he's been plagued, hasn't he? Uh Carl Frampton. I mean, we're only a few days away from the fight. I mean, touch wood, and I am actually 
I am actually touching wood, the desk right in front of me, um, because I don't want anything to happen last minute that'll put the fight off, you know, it seems like on fight week, it's like the worst time for Carl Frampton, you know, he's had the statue fall on his hand, he's had the, uh, you know, the guy slipping in the bath, but that guy, like I say, is back against Oscar Valdez, even though Frampton's on the bill himself, um, but yeah, Gutierrez, I mean, it's, I remember when Frampton was supposed to fight him. It wasn't really a fight I was interested in, to be honest. And again, I'm not really interested in it for for Vargas. I mean, he's he's obviously stepping up in weight. You know, it's probably going to be a bit of a war. Both obviously Mexican fighters. Both men have got a dig on them. And um, Gutierrez is a tough guy. You know, he's got the two losses. Never been stopped though. Um, so yeah, for me. That, that that could be interesting. I don't even think he's been down, actually, Gutierrez. So that could be... When I say interesting, I think Valdez wins, but I think that could be a bit of a war, um, which Valdez seems to love. He loves to tear up. Also on the bill, Carlos Adames, 18-0. He's in a 12-rounder against Patrick Texera, who is 30-1. and That one's over 12. And then, like I said, Carl Frampton, to, to finish it up, 26-2 and in a 10-rounder against Tyler McCreary. Again, this guy has an undefeated record, 16-0 and with one draw. Um, I've been told he's not a bad fighter, McCreary, but I've got to be honest, I've not seen anything of him. I mean, it's not a fight I want to see for Carl Frampton, I've got to be honest. I want to see him in those bigger fights. Um, it's not a fight that I am overly looking forward to, and... You know, this guy, McCreary, is like the guy he was going to fight in Philadelphia. Someone I didn't really want to see him in with. He's like the guy, you know, Gutierrez. I didn't really want to see him in with those guys. I want to see him in the bigger fights. I'm not quite sure what's going on because he's been talking a lot about Jamel Herring um, for some kind of St. Patrick's Day showdown. But yeah, Tyler McCreary, again, um, you know, the height, the height could be interesting. I think he... You know, he was a decent amateur. I think he won a couple national titles, stuff like that. Um, But yeah, as a pro, hasn't really done anything amazing. I mean, obviously, he's still undefeated, but a lot of his opponents had losing records and stuff like that, you know. So, yeah, not, you know, not not going to be able to pose a threat to Carl Frampton, in my honest opinion. And the worst thing is that draw on his record. You look at that. I mean, he drew with Roberto Castaneda earlier this year. And, um... That's just, that's just, I don't know, it's hard to overlook really. Castaneda's been been beaten very well by many, many fighters, you know. And uh, yeah, that doesn't look good on his slate there. But anyways, that's everything for the preview part of the show, which now brings us to the end. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as Sumra has been I as Sumra. A massive thank you to our one guest on this week's show, the reigning IBF and WBA super, super bantamweight champion of the world, Danny Roman. The reason we only had one guest on the show is because one other boxer who I who I shall not name, totally messed me around. I mean, we scheduled an interview for 2 a.m. UK time, and by 7 a.m. UK time, when my eyes were trying to close on me, I was getting nothing back from him or his team. So I'm deeply sorry that we couldn't deliver two guests on this week's show. Um, You know, I really take the podcast deadly seriously, and uh, I feel like we've under-delivered quite badly. So, um just want to say if you've stuck with me for the duration of this week's show then I salute you and I thank you for listening Uh, one piece of news that has broken while we've been recording the show is that Dillian White will box on the Joshua undercard in Saudi Arabia on December 7th against Marius Wack the prediction league currently stands at myself in the lead on 23 points you the listeners are in second place with 17 points and Ayaz is at the back in third with 16 points once again thank you all for listening and we hope to see you all again next week